Okay, so the last but not the least talk is about performance modeling and scalability optimization of distributed deep learning systems. And the presenter is Alatunji Ruwase from Microsoft Research. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ron. Uh, welcome. Um, thank you for coming for my talk. Uh, this work is in collaboration, a collaboration between the College of William and Mary and Microsoft Research. So, um, as you might be aware, deep learning has uh, gained a lot of interest, has garnered a lot of interest in industry and research, uh, mainly because of the state-of-the-art performance that DNM models have shown on a, a variety of um, challenging uh, AI tasks in the domain of vision, speech, and text processing. And one thing we've learned is that the, uh, the requirements for any particular task is really a function of the complexity of the task. So for example, um, recognizing handwritten digits uh, can be done using a relatively small model size and a relatively small amount of data, both of which will fit on a single machine. However, um, to recognize high resolution images, that requires um, DNN models that are significantly larger and potentially which ones that have billions of parameters that need to be trained. And training such large models typically require a large amount of data as well. And so at this scale, training such models is really impractical if you want to do it on a single machine, simply because it, takes you, it might take you a long time to even iterate over the training data. And to address this, researchers have proposed frameworks that enable distributed training of large DNN models using large data. And these frameworks, they exploit various kinds of parallelism techniques, one of which is model parallelism. Here, the idea is basically a model that would not fit, that's too large to fit on a single machine, gets partitioned over multiple machines. And the standard terminology is to refer to the ensemble of machines that where you've partitioned your model as a model replica. And an individual machine within that replica is called a worker. Furthermore, data parallelism is another form of parallelism, it's another parallelism technique where basically the large training data you have, you can process it quickly by basically uh, partitioning it across multiple model replicas. So each model replica is responsible for a partition of the data. This replica is all uh, share parameters through a parameter server to ensure convergence. And even at the parameter server level, we can also exploit parallelism here by basically partitioning the, the model's parameters across multiple machines. So using a combination of these three techniques, model parallelism, data parallelism, and parameter parallelism, these frameworks enable us to train very large models into reasonable accuracy in a matter of days. But the question that this this frameworks leave on leave unanswered is really as a researcher if i have a large dnn model and i have um, i have access to a large cluster of machines what is the right way for me to configure my distributed system such that i have an optimal configuration and optimal here for us really means minimize the time it takes for me to iterate over the training data so this is the question that's left unanswered so specifically out of my uh, distributed hardware that I have, how many of them should I partition into my parameter server system? How many model replicas should I have? And how big should my model replicas be? And this is the problem we've ad addressed in this work. Now, why is this important? Why is an optimal system configuration which minimizes the iteration time over training data? Why should we care about this? To evaluate this, we looked at, we considered the training of a, of a model, a large model, for the ImageNet 22K um, uh, task. Here where you're trying to classify, uh, image classification task. And we did this on a relatively small cluster of 20 machines where we explored various um, system configurations that you could come up with in terms of partitioning your, your machines for different parallelism uh, modes. So here on the x-axis, I'm basically showing, and each dot on this graph represents a system configuration. So on the x-axis, we are basically scaling the replica size. So how many, how much model parallelism are we exploiting? On the y-axis, we're basically scaling the number of replicas. So how many model replicas, how much data parallelism are we exploiting here? <laughs> 
Now, like I said, each dot there represents a particular system configuration. We fixed the size of the parameter server parallelism here just to reduce the search space. Now, the size of each dot here represents the amount of time it takes to iterate over some um, no, amount of data, not the entire training data set, but some small sample of the training set. And as we can see here, the red dot, which is the smallest, is what we will consider the optimal configuration, simply because it allows us to iterate over the data the fastest. But why is this important? We see that compared to, um, a, to the worst um, configuration here, the fastest configuration is actually an order of magnitude or more faster. So having an optimal system configuration means we can go over our training data significantly faster compared to a worse configuration. And even compared to like a random, like a median configuration there, we're still noticeably faster. So this is the benefit of having, of picking an optimal configuration. However, this is very challenging to pick because even here, as we can see, the configuration space is really large. For just a small cluster of 20 machines, here we have dozens of configurations that we would have to individually enumerate and test to see what the, uh, you know, the iteration time would be. And so doing this empirically is really time and resource consuming and it's not ideal. Also, the answer that we get after going through this entire process will be specific to this particular model and to this particular hardware budget. And so that means when I get a bigger cluster, I'll have to do this experiment all over again or if I get a new task. And so how do we address this? Our approach is basically to analytically export, explore the configuration space. So we are able to get away uh, with, without needing any of the exp expensive experimentation that will be required with enumer uh, uh, enumerating them empirically. And we're using a system here that basically has two major components to it. Uh, the system takes as input um, a description of, your, of a DNN model that is to be trained and some description of the distributed hardware budget that we have. So which kind of machines we have, what kind of networking uh, hardware do we have. And so having that, so the first component that we have is what we call the uh, scalability optimizer. And the job of this is basically to figure out the system configurations that are viable in the configuration space. Um, for each system configuration, it gives it to the performance model uh, components, which gives an estimate of how long this system configuration would iterate over some amount of training data for the particular DNN. And so the key, th and then so based on that, the uh, scalability optimizer, having evaluated different configurations, uh, will then be able to then output what would be an optimal configuration for the particular DNN model. And the key features that we have for this component is that the scalability optimizer will efficiently explore the space. So the configuration space, as we'll see in more details later, is quite exponential in terms of the parameters. But we, our scalability optimizer is able to explore this efficiently in polynomial time. Our performance model, uh, basically the, the task that they have to do is for a given con system configuration, because since this is an instantiation of the various parallelism techniques that you have, it needs to be able to estimate the impact of things like model parallelism, data parallelism, and parameter parallelism on actual computation time. So in the rest of the talk, I'll be focusing on these two components, the scalability optimizer and the performance models. So the performance models, like I said, basically estimates the impact of model parallelism and data parallelism on computation time. In terms of model parallelism, remember, this is when we take a model and we partition it across multiple machines. And so there are two components of time to consider here. One is the time spent on local computation and the time spent communicating across the machines. The local computation time is really a function of the number of connections that you have on each box, uh, the number of neurons, and the, the cost of the basic operations. So here we use a few experiments uh, to estimate the, basic, uh, the, uh, the cost of the basic operations. By that I mean things like multiplication and addition per machine. So we need just a handful of experiments and then we, uh, we, we use that to estimate the rest of the time. The remote communication here is really a function of the cross-machine uh, uh, activations. And so here we can see that typically with deep neural networks, there are two classes of layers, that are the convolutional layers, which have very little uh, remote connectivity there, and then the fully connected layers, which have massive amounts of connectivity. And so 
Factoring in both the amount of communication and the network, uh, uh, your, uh, your network device, uh, the latency and bandwidth, you are able to estimate how much time it takes to communicate. So combining these two things together, we can estimate you know, the computation time within a model replica. Going further, we can then look at what is the impact of data parallelism. And really the key impact here really is the communication with the parameter server. And that is really a function of the model size, the number of replicas that you have, the mini batch size, which is how frequently do we communicate with the parameter server, and then the, param the parameter server bandwidth. So we, have to, we make some assumptions in terms of the contention that the replicas can place on the parameter server bandwidth, because that is the, really the bottleneck. How quickly can they communicate with it? And we assume here that um, reads are the only synchronous updates, uh, synchronous operations, and so training would actually stall while we are reading uh, from the parameter server, but we can send updates asynchronously. So combining these two components, the time spent within the model replica and the time spent communicating with the parameter server, our performance models are able to estimate the time it would take uh, a particular system configuration to iterate over some amount of training data. So moving on to the scalability optimizer. Here, uh, the question we're trying to answer is that for given the space of system configurations, um, you know, we want to efficiently find an optimal one using, by using the performance model to estimate uh, you know, the iteration time per, for each one. Now, the space itself is really large, and it's really a function of the amount of resources you have, how big is your cluster that you're using, and it's also a function of how many of your network, your uh, DNN architecture, how many layers do you have, um, and how exactly are you partitioning them, so for a given system configuration. And I wouldn't go through all of the details, but I hope you get a sense that it's really a large space, it's exponential in fact. And so what's the idea here? The idea here is that we know that exhaustively enumerating will just not work. It's impractical. It's too slow. But we take advantage. We come up with. We have. Uh, we came up with an efficient algorithm that takes advantage of two key properties. One is we we are very careful in terms of how we allocate workers to. Uh, partitions of layers that need to be computed. So we essentially achieve this sort of bipartite graph matching, which helps us to minimize the amount of remote connections across the workers within a uh, model replica. And then secondly, we sort of build up the solution in a dynamic programming way, where first we figure out what is the right configuration for the input layer, and then using that we build up what the next will be appropriate for the next layer, and gradually we sort of build up solutions there using dynamic programming. And essentially we end up with um, uh, a polynomial time solution. So in terms of evaluation, um, we basically looked at an image recognition task, ImageNet 22K, which is basically a classification into 22,000 categories of 15 million high resolution images. Um, we used the state of the art model for doing this. Uh, which contains about two billion parameters. Uh, we use the Atom Deep Learning System, which is also state of the art for distributed machine learning, uh, for distributed deep learning, uh, and it provides us the three knobs of model parallelism, data parallelism, and uh, parameter server parallelism. We use a small cluster of 20 machines of commodity servers, and uh, we basically, in this results that I'm going to show, we're just going to be focusing on the performance models in terms of how accurately do they estimate the scalability of each parallelism technique, how well do they estimate the relative performance of two configurations, and then finally, how well do they estimate the absolute time to iterate over some amount of training data. So first, we look at scalability. And here I'm showing three graphs where, because we're estimating the scalability of model parallelism, data parallelism, and parameter server parallelism. For each data, we basically fix the other two dimensions of parallelism, and then we scale on one parallelism. So for example, um, on the uh, far right, basically where we have the model parallelism graph, we've, we are basically scaling the replica size from one to four. This is within the constraints of our cluster size. And we do the same for uh, the other uh, parallelism techniques. The red lines indicate our estimates, and the black lines show what we get through measurement. So that's sort of the ground truth. Well, and one thing that's known about this different parallelism techniques is that they basically scale differently. So um, model parallelism is known to scale superlinearly as your work because of cache effects. As your model fits more into cache, you get uh, superlinear scaling. But data parallelism scales typically linearly because you partition the data sort of across uh, different replicas. Parameter server 
parallelism scales as long as the parameter survey is the bottleneck. And after that, it doesn't scale anymore. So what's interesting is that we see here that our, uh, and, and on the y-axis, just explain, this is the speed up relative to like just a, 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 a sequential, uh, the, the, the one data points basically. And so what we see here is that our, our models are able to actually capture the individual scalability trends for the different kinds of parallelism techniques, which is good. The next uh, evaluation is really we want to compare between different configurations. And the way we went about this is by, we came up with like eight configurations. And so we show them here in the first column, which is where each configuration is represented using three, line, uh, three numbers. The first number indicates the, uh, the replica size, so the number of workers in the replica. The second number indicates the number of replicas, and the last number shows the number of uh, the, uh, machines that are used for parameter server. And so we have eight there. The second column indicates the ranking in terms of how, what, uh, how long it takes for this model, uh, this com uh, configurations to iterate over some amount of training data. And, and then the last column shows what our models estimated. And uh, our models match the measurements exactly. And this is really because we've been able to capture the effects of these various forms of parallelism on the computation and communication. Finally, we estimated uh, the absolute uh, time to iterate over the training data, over the training data. And here we also sh I'm presenting this for scaling on the three different dimensions of parallelism. And here we don't exactly match measurements, which is not surprising because we, are, we do not model precisely. But um, what we, sh we have about a 25% error uh, relative to measurements. But this is okay because we think the most, useful, uh, the most common case where people would, uh, this will be used is to decide between a good mo uh, configuration and a bad one, not necessarily how much better or how much worse it is. And so we think it's still a useful result. Now, before I conclude, I also want to sort of briefly talk a bit about uh, um, convergence. I want, to, want us to note that convergence really isn't an issue here for us because that's a function of more of the hyperparameter settings that you have. Rather, what we're interested in here is how quickly can you iterate over the training data. So in conclusion, here I have presented a system that enables uh, uh, deep learning experts to basically use distributed hardware efficiently to do large scale training. We, the system enables them to come up with good configurations without, without having to uh, run, do um, expensive experiments or require distributed systems expertise for configuring. The, so, the solution comprises of two components. One is the performance models, which are able to estimate uh, the time it takes to iterate over some amount of training data using different forms of parallelism that existing frameworks provide. And we have a scalability optimizer, which is able to efficiently explore the configuration space in polynomial time, even though the, uh, the space is actually exponential. And with that, I conclude, and I'll take questions. Thank you. One question. Thank you. So uh, I was a bit more curious about the model used to estimate. Is it polynomial? Do you, uh, sorry, is it like polynomial or do you do some kind of interpolation? How do you set the constants? Uh, we do a couple, a bunch of, uh, cop both actually. We start out with a polynomial and for the things that are really difficult, we actually get some, like I said, we do some simple experiments to get some constants that we used to set there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That's the end of the session. Thank you guys. <laughs>